Okay, we're there in First Samuel chapter number 10, and you might remember last week we saw that Saul got, he was chosen by God, and he also was chosen by Samuel, you know, he was the one that selected him out to, to be the king. Um, remember, he was, a, he was a man who was very tall in stature, but he was described as someone who was little in his own sight, so he was actually quite humble. We'll just jump, jump straight into it. Look at verse number 1. First Samuel chapter 10 and verse number 1, it says, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? It's interesting that he takes this vial of oil and he pours it on his head. You might wonder, what's that all about? Well, in the Bible, um, there's a, there's a, basically the oil is a type of, of the Holy Spirit. And obviously, for someone to be the leader, for someone to be a king, he needs the Holy Spirit upon him. And um, you actually see that in the New Testament. If you look at... Uh, Look at First John chapter number two, First John chapter number two, and verse number twenty-seven. It refers to the anointing which we have. It says in First John chapter number two, verse twenty-seven, it says, "But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you." So notice that you've got this anointing, but remember, anointing that's like oil poured on top of you. But the anointing which you've received of him abideth in you. So it's something you've got inside you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. So we've got this anointing, and what's it going to do? It's going to teach us. Keep your finger there in First John chapter number 2, and look back at John, the Gospel of John. I think this talks about this. I didn't put this in my notes, but it just came to me then. Um, first John, uh, sorry, John chapter number, um, John 14. John 14, for example, it says in John 14, it says, um, at least the verse 25, John 14, verse 25, says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So notice, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, what's the purpose? One of the things is to teach us things. And that's what we see there in First John chapter number 2. It says, You need not that any man teach you, but the same anointing teaches you all things. So that's saying the Holy Ghost is going to teach us all things. Now, some people take this the wrong way, and they say, okay, therefore, we don't need any teachers. You know, we don't need to come to church. We don't need to read our Bible. You know, God's going to teach us the Holy Spirit. He's just going to teach us. Mm. But, of course, we need to remember that the author of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. You know, Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay, and obviously God has, has, has ordained within the church. He's, he's ordained, you know, to be pastors and teachers, you know, to teach us. And obviously that's not what they can do. That can help us learn. But of course we do realise that there's nothing that we could learn from someone teaching us that we couldn't learn just from the Bible. In other words, if it's some new revelation that some person, this person gives it to you and you could never get it yourself out of the Bible, it's like, well, okay, well that shows you it didn't come from the Bible. That's something that that person made up. Okay. Anyway, let's get back to First Samuel chapter number 10. First Samuel chapter number 10. So Samuel, he, he pours his boil and takes his oil, pours on his head, he kissed him. He says, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Okay, so um, this is something that's just basically happened. Remember, of course, this is done privately, because remember, this. if you look back at the end of the previous chapter, um, as they were going down, verse number 27, as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on, but stand there still a while that I may show thee the word of God. So this is just... This is just between Samuel and Saul, what's going on at this point. Now, later on in the chapter, he's going to get selected in front of all of the people. And in fact, at the end of chapter number 11, after he, gets, after he delivers them from the Ammonites, all the people are going to declare him king. So it's like, you know, Samuel's saying, oh, you're going to be the king. And then later on, more people, you know, it's, it's, it, he's chosen out of all the tribes. And then later on, everyone ends up declaring um, that he is the king. Look down at verse number two. And when thou art departed from me today... Then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zalza. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shall they go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and they shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying... A bottle of wine. So it's interesting here. Samuel tells Saul all these things that are that are going to happen. He says, "This is what's going to happen." He says, "You know, um, you're going to find two men 
by Rachel's sepulchre or Rachel's tomb, the border of Benjamin. And they're going to say these things to you. You're going to go forward from there. You're going to come to this plain and you're going to meet three men. And they're going to be carrying these things and they're going to salute you and they're going to give you a couple of loaves of bread and all these things. He's telling them these things that are going to, what's going to happen in the future. And of course, we know obviously only God knows the future. But Samuel, he's, he's revealed the future to Samuel and that's what he's telling Saul. It kind of reminds me a little bit the wording of what you see in... Um, Luke chapter number 22. Look at Luke chapter number 22. Keep your finger in 1 Samuel 10, but look at Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 7. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 7. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he, this is Jesus, sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. It's the same sort of thing. Jesus is saying, Go over here, and you meet some person who's carrying this thing, and go, and, and he's going to take it. Why? Because Jesus knew the future. Just exactly the same thing as we see here with Samuel and what he's saying to Saul. Look at verse number 5. <clears throat> After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. So Samuel tells Saul he is going to meet a company of prophets. One of the things this tells us is that was Samuel the only prophet in Israel? No. There's a bunch of other prophets. He wasn't the only prophet in Israel. And it would be a good thing, it would be a great thing if more of God's people were prophets. Obviously, we've got the, the men's preaching night coming up, and you know that's a good thing. It's a great opportunity for you guys to preach. And so it's important. Get prepared. It's not something, we don't want there to be only Samuel, you want there to be more prophets, we want more people to be preaching, and so prepare for that. Actually, look if you would at, um, look at Numbers chapter number 11, look at Numbers chapter number 11, Numbers chapter number 11, because some people have this idea, well it's just an exclusive thing, we only want these certain people to be preaching, but no, that's not, that's not the attitude that, that we see God's people have, in fact, one of the greatest prophets has ever been is, is Moses, and look and see what he says, Numbers chapter number 11, and verse number 24 Numbers chapter number 11 and verse number 24. It says, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, that's unto Moses, and took of the spirit that was upon him. So obviously God's spirit was upon Moses. And he gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not see. So notice, God's taken his spirit, which he'd put on Moses, and he took some of it and put it on these 70 other men. What did they do? They then prophesied. They then preached and did not cease. Mm. But it's interesting, look at verse number 26. It says, But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So a couple of people that were supposed to go out, but didn't, they stayed where they were. The, the Spirit came upon them, and what did they start doing? They started preaching, they started prophesying. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. So he's saying, Look, These guys didn't come out, and yet they're, they're preaching, they're prophesying back there. What does Moses say? And Moses said unto him, Invest thou for my sake. Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them. So we notice, once again, the Spirit is very much associated with prophesying, with preaching, having the Spirit upon you. But what's Moses' attitude? Is it like, I'm the only one in this club, I don't want anyone else to be preached? No. He says, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them. You won't bother turning there, but you're all familiar with Acts chapter number 2. Remember the day of Pentecost came? And the Holy Spirit came upon people. And, and he, he says this was in fulfillment of prophecy. And he says, look, your young men and your old men and your, and your, you know, your, your men and your women, handmaids, everyone, they shall do what? Prophesy. They shall preach. And so there's a need for God's people to be preached. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, boy or a girl, young or old, we should be preaching. Now, obviously, there's limitations within church. Guess what? There is limitations. It's, it's only for men to be preaching. 
It's only for men. It's not for women to be preaching. But out there, we should all be preaching. Okay? And if you are a man, okay, then you should be aiming to think, oh, I want to preach. You might say, well, I can't preach. Well, then what should you do? The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Get into the word. Study the word. Read the word. Learn the word. And you'll find things that you can share with people. Okay? Um, so, yes, here's a key thing to understand is that, you know, in order to preach, this necessary ingredient, ingredient though, is it's to have God's Spirit on you. Now, just a note, of course, back in the Old Testament, they didn't have the, the, um, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we do see, you know, the Spirit coming upon people and then prophesying. So, in, in, in the New Testament, um, we do have, now, what, when you're saved, you call on the Lord, you have faith, you believe, you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside you. But even in the New Testament, we see people praying, the place where they were was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. So they still had the Holy Spirit coming on them in power. Okay? And we need the Holy Ghost to come on us in power. You know, we need the, his power. And so beware. we should beware of things that might take away God's Spirit. I mean, there's, there's a very famous psalm that talks about this. Look, if you would, at um, Psalm 51. <coughs> psalm 51. We're all familiar with... Um, the sin that uh, David committed with Bathsheba. And um, this was a psalm that he wrote um, after this. It says in Psalm 51, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan, Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And what does he say? He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the, unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He, he sinned. He transgressed God's law. He says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou, when thou judgest. Mm. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. And then look at verse number 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So look, cleanse my heart. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So he's saying, because of my, what I've done, don't take my Holy Spirit. Now, this is not talking about the indwelling, but this is talking about the power of the Spirit resting upon him. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Why? Because if the Spirit's taken away, is, is, they, is David going to be teaching transgressors God's ways? Are sinners going to be converted? No, not without the Spirit. Okay, turn back if you would to um, uh, 1 Samuel 10. And um, verse number 5, so it, it talked about here, it says, um, uh, You may have come to the, uh, they shall come to the hill of God. Oh yeah, but yeah, notice here it says, They're going to come down for the high place with a psaltery, with a tabret, and a pipe, and a harp before them. And they shall prophesy. So it's interesting that um, we see music associated with prophesying. I mean, David, who was you know, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, you know, he obviously wrote a whole part of the Psalms. What was David? He was musical, wasn't he? He wrote Psalms, which we sing, but also remember, um, in fact, we'll get onto it later on, he played the harp. That's how he sort of was introduced, you know, that they brought him in before Saul later on to, to comfort him. What did he do? He played the harp. David was a musical person. So he sang and he played music, and obviously, but he was a prophet, you know, and so we see these two things going together. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I often... I'd say the majority of my sermons that I prepare, I actually, I listen to music while I do it. Okay, now I don't listen to, you know, contemporary Christian music. I don't, in fact, I don't even listen to hymns. Because I, I find, if, I, if I'm listening to music, that um, even if it's just the instrumental of the hymns, mm. I can't really do that. Because when you listen to the music, the words go into your head. And so it's, it's just going to affect what you're thinking. So I tend to just listen to instrumental, you know, piano type music and stuff that has no words associated with it. But I, I, yeah, I, I, that's the majority of the, the sermon preparation I do. Maybe it's because I live in a noisy house and there's you know children around, so I put you know ear things on or whatever. But I find that to be really helpful. Yeah. 
you know, even sometimes I'll be sitting there at night, I'll be working on a sermon, and if I'm just sitting there working, it's just silent. Yeah. You know, sometimes I do that, but sometimes it's like I actually think better. Yes. And, and, you know, the, the, the scriptures come to mind when you're, when you're associated with music. That, that's just something that I personally find. Anyway, let's look back at First Samuel chapter number uh, 10, verse number 6. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. So it says the Holy Spirit is going to come on Saul, he's going to be changed. And obviously, I mean, we know we need the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to do what we can't do in our own strength. Look, if you were at um, John chapter number 15, we sang it earlier on, but John chapter number 15 and verse number 5, John chapter 15 and verse number 5, it says, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us. Because if I don't, that's why before, you know, that's why I pray before preaching that God would fill me with the Spirit. Because in and of myself, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing, my words are just going to be, you know, they'll just go in one ear and out the other. But God's word has power when it's empowered by the Spirit. And it's the same thing. When we go out to preach, when you go out to preach the gospel to someone, mm. we pray every time we go out asking God would fill us with the Spirit so that, so that we have the power. He knows, he, he will lead us and guide us to what to say with the people that we're talking to. He'll bring to our remembrance whatsoever he said unto us. Okay? Um, verse number seven. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou shalt do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. So God was with Saul. Now, it's interesting. How can some people claim that Saul wasn't saved? Have you heard people talk about Saul wasn't saved? Yeah, people reckon that Saul was Why? Because he did lots of bad things and he killed himself. So does that mean if you do lots of bad things and kill yourself that you're not saved? That's what a lot of people think. But no. I mean, basically, yeah, there's a lot of wicked things that Saul did later in his life. In fact, the Holy Spirit departed from him. But... You know, because as we said, you know, he didn't have the he didn't have the indwelling. I mean, actually, just look at this. This might help just to clarify it. Look, if look at John chapter number fourteen. You might still have your finger in John fifteen. I should have said to stay there. But if you look at John fourteen, we can see where where Jesus promised this. He said, um, John fourteen verse number sixteen. He said, and I will pray the Father. He's speaking to his disciples here, and he shall give you another Comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So notice that, he's saying, look, he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. You say, well, he dwells with you? How come? Well, look at the next verse. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So notice, Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit's going to come and indwell you. Currently, he's with you. How? Because he was actually there in the person of Jesus Christ. Because in the same way Jesus said, I and my Father are one, well, guess what? There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay? Mm. And so he's saying, look, but what's going to happen? I'm going to leave, but then I'm going to come back in the person of the Holy Ghost. And he says, I'm going to, I'm, I, I dwell with you, but I'm going to be in you. Okay? And there's many, I mean, many scriptures talk about that. Look, at, look for example, at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 16. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Look back at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 9. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. Romans 8 9 says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So notice that's used interchangeably, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. And if Christ be in you, so who's in you? Christ. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, well hang on, who's the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead? Surely you know, the Father raised up Jesus from the dead. Well, if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, that's the Spirit of the Father, dwell in you. Well, why? Because the Spirit of Christ is in you. 
because the Spirit of Father, the Father's in you, because the Holy Spirit's in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Look at uh, Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 25. Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 25. <clears throat> Colossians 1, 25. He says, Wherefore, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to a saint. So this is something that wasn't known in the past, but is now known in the New Testament. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That was something that was new. It only happened after Jesus, you know, he died and rose again. Okay, we had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, in fact, we won't bother turning there, but it talks about that at the end of the Gospels. Remember, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay, turn back to um, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 10. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse number, verse number 8. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. So Samuel, notice here, he gives Saul clear instructions for what's going to happen and what he has to do. And we'll find out later on that, guess what? He didn't really pay attention to those you know, um, instructions that he gave him. Verse number nine. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. So it says here, God gave Saul another heart. Now, I don't think this is talking about Saul getting saved. I don't think it was like he wasn't saved. He just got saved at that point. Because, you know, you only get saved one time, you know. Um, but, of course, you can grow in grace. You can grow in the, in the knowledge of God. I mean, Second Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To, uh, you know, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Jeremiah 24.7 says, And I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. You see, your heart can be with God or not. Okay, And he says, here, look, he gave him another heart. Verse number 10. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. So here the Spirit comes upon Saul again. He prophesies along with the other prophets. You know, and, and it's interesting because you've got all these different prophets that are there. In the Bible, you'll find examples where there were prophets that stood alone. It was just they were the only one. They were the only prophet. You know, there was maybe everyone was compromising or hiding or fearful. But at the same time, it's helpful to be around like-minded people. It's helpful if you're a prophet to have other prophets, you know, to, all, to, to, to be like-minded. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's such a good thing to be in church. It's good to be in church as much as possible because you're around people who are like-minded. You know, look, if you were at Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 24, Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and verse number 24, Hebrews 10, 24, says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Notice that, assembling ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it's like we should gather together as God's people in his house. We need to assemble. And do we need to do it more or less? We need to do more. You know, so guess what? If you come to church once a week, hey, it's better if you come twice a week. If you come twice a week, hey, it's better if you come three times a week. Come three times a week, hey, it's better if you catch up. Go out soul within us. You know, go, regularly be with God's people. And that's something to be helpful. I mean, I like to use the example of, think about coals in a fire. You know, you think you've got a fire burning away, you've got coals, and you take some tongs and you take a coal out of the fire and plop it on the hearth by itself, away from the fire. What's going to happen to that coal that's by itself? Is it going to stay with the same heat and burning and intensity as the fire? No, it's not. It's going to go cold. You know, now I wouldn't touch it straight away. It's still going to have some heat. But in comparison to the ones in the fire, it's not going to be anything close. Okay? And so the thing about it is, is that having other believers who are zealous for God, that will inspire you to greater service for the Lord. You know, when you're around people, I'm going out soul winning. You want to come out soul winning for me? That inspires you to go out. You know, that inspires you to do what God wants you to do. You know, and the thing is, it's interesting, because the environment that you're in, it can have a big impact on your behavior. 
I was reading this thing recently about a, it was a thing that was talking about um, some study they did and they had, it was just like water coolers and, and they, they had these water coolers in some office and, and they were basically just, they recorded how often people would use the water coolers and how often they would, you know, there was other places, soft drinks or coffees or whatever. And what they did is they, they didn't tell anyone anything but they increased the size I think it was increased the size and the quantity of the water cooler. So it was, or more space was given to the water cooler. So there's more places to think, hey, I'm going to drink water. Mm. And they didn't tell anyone anything. And what they found is the number of people drinking water went up. Mm-hmm. Just because it was like they saw it more. It was in the, in the visual field, if you like. You know? I mean, it's kind of thing. It's something that would be helpful. It's if you're wanting to eat the right food versus eat the wrong food. Yeah. If you're wanting to eat more fruit, then get a bowl, yeah. fill it with fruit, Pop it on the bench, and it's in front of you, and you see it, and you think, oh, I feel like that. But guess what? If you have a bowl and put a whole pile of chocolate or whatever, you want, you'll see that, and you'll think about that. You know? Well, that's why we tend to keep our, our chocolate biscuits and whatnot, you know, we tend to keep them in the freezer. Okay? And one of the reasons for that, I mean, actually, I've, I've got my bar, I, should, I tend to eat about a king-size block of chocolate per week, as a rule, generally. But I keep it, I keep it in the fridge, but I keep it behind, I've got, I keep it behind the butter. There's two blocks of butter, and I slide it behind there. And it's, I mean, I know it's there. But the thing is, if I go to the fridge and open the fridge, and if I see the chocolate, then I'll feel like I need some chocolate. Whereas, if it's hidden behind the butter, then if I decide I want some, hey, that's fine, I go to the fridge and I open open it and have some. But it's different, just by altering whether you can see it or not. If you want to be eating something, put it in front of you. If you don't want to be eating something... Put it away, you know. I've heard about people do the same sort of thing. They take something and they put it, instead of putting it in the cupboards, they put it somewhere where they've got to go and get a stool, get on a shelf, get up and get it to get it down. Now, they can still get it if they want it. That's fine. But it just makes it a little bit more difficult, okay? Just the, the environment actually affects you. And guess what? Here we see with, with Saul, the environment he was in. He was with these company of prophets. And what happened when he was with the company of prophets? The Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. Um, verse number 11 and it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that behold he prophesied among the prophets then the people said one to another what is this that has come unto the son of Kish is Saul also among the prophets so people were amazed at the change that happened to Saul Saul was suddenly preaching that what, what's, what's Saul doing he's preaching what caused the change well there was two things basically the spirit of God came upon him and also the people he was with he was with these prophets. The, the, he was with these prophets. The people he was with changed. It says in uh, don't turn there, but Second Corinthians five seventeen says, "Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new." Now, this verse is often misused by people to say, "Well, if your life doesn't dramatically change, then you aren't really saved. If you don't have some drastic change, then you aren't really saved." Well, what that is, that's just another way of teaching work salvation. That's all it is. When someone gets saved, God creates a new spirit in them. It's often referred to as the new man. But guess what? We still have the old man. We still have the old man. And that means there's actually a battle to be fought. Look, if you were at Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 22. Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians 4 and verse number 22. Ephesians 4. And obviously this is written to believers. This is written to people who are saved. Ephesians 4.22 says that he put off concerning the former conversation the old man. He's saying, look, put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man. He's like, put off the old man, put on the new man. It's like, it's like put off, it's like take, take off your old jacket, put on a new jacket. Put off some old garment, put on a new garment, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness, and then he, got, he gives description. He says, look, Wherefore, put away lying. So that's the old man. Put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. He says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. That's the old man. Don't be a thief. Don't steal. Don't take things that aren't yours. But rather let him labour, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. So instead of taking things... Give. Old man versus new man. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying that may minister grace unto the hearers. So don't have corrupt communication. Don't have, you know, bad words coming out of your mouth. 
Instead, have things that are going to edify, things that are going to build up people. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you seal unto the day of redemption. So now, notice, this is talking to saved people. This is saying to saved people, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't let foul words come out of your mouth. This is what he's saying. But instead, build people up with your words. You know, work hard so you can give to people and tell the truth. Okay? Where does that fit in these people that say, oh, you know, well, if you're saved, this is just going to happen. Automatically. Then why is Paul bother bothering to tell people to do it? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So he says, look, put away this, this bitterness, you know, and instead be forgiven. Because those are kind of opposites. You know, if you're forgiving, it's like this person's done you wrong and you forgive them. You don't hold it against them. But what's bitterness? Someone's done you wrong and you hold it against them. You hang on to it. You're bitter. You're bearing a grudge. Um, verse, uh, chapter, look at chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. He says, look, be a follower of God. Walk in love. Just like Christ loved, that's what you should do. He says, but look, for, fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. He says, don't be committing fornication. Don't be unclean. Don't be covetous. Because that's not becoming for a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which is not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Once again, instead of foul stuff coming out of your mouth, good stuff coming out of your mouth. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. This is saying, if you're doing these things, do you think Jesus is going to have lots of rewards when he comes back? Well, when he comes back, he will have lots of rewards, but is he going to be giving them giving to the whoremonger, the unclean, the covetous, the idolater? No, he's not. Okay? Let no man deceive with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Don't be fooled. The unsaved people, God's angry with them because they're doing those. Don't you be doing it there. He says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't you take part in those filthy things. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. He's saying, look, you are light in the Lord. But then he says, walk as children of light. He says, look, you're light. You're saved. You've got the indwelling Holy Spirit. You've got the new man. Put off the old man. Stop these old things. Stop the, the, the old ways. Get rid of them. Get them out of your life. That's what he's saying. Okay, and so it's important we need to understand. That's why the Apostle Paul, he says, I die daily. I die, you know, put to death. The old man, in fact, as you look at, um, uh, look at Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. We often sing this one. Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 6. Romans 6, 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. But it's not that the old man, that, you know, well, he's dead and that's okay, we don't have to worry about him anymore. Because what did Paul say? I die daily, put to death. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. So Jesus, he just died once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So count yourselves to be dead. Reckon yourselves to be dead. But that's something that you have to do in an ongoing basis. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in the it's not. It's not that the old man is dead. Oh, you don't worry about it. He says, look, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let the old man be in charge. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. He says, look, this is not what should happen. You're under grace. Therefore, don't let it rule over you. And he's not saying, you know, some people say, okay, therefore we can just do whatever we want. He says, look, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? God forbid. That's not what we should be doing. But it's like, put away, you know. Now the thing is, we can decide we're going to serve God, or we can decide we're going to serve sin. It's our choice. And the thing is, two things that will have a big impact on that. One is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, if you're to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what do you have to do? You've got to get the sin out of your life. Because is God going to want to put his spirit on an unclean vessel? 
No. Okay, so that's why we should cleanse ourselves from you know, all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. Get the sin out of your life. But also the, the people you associate with, the importance of being in a good church, where you'll be encouraged to serve God and not discouraged. Because it's, it's hard. I mean, some people are in a church where, you know, it's like they're not really being encouraged. You know, there's no one else going soul winning in their church. Now, I've heard people say, you know, you really, you've got to get out and you've got to go somewhere else. And it's so, like, yeah, well, maybe if there's a better church you can go, fair enough. But if you're in a city where there are no other good churches, there's no other churches where there's someone going soul winning, does that, you should you pack up to go to some other city, go to some other country? Well, what about all the people in that place? They're dying and going to hell. They need someone to give them the gospel. You'd be better off to stay where you are and actually just go soul winning. Now, is it the easiest thing to do? No, it's hard, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Just decide you're going to do it. Okay? Um, a good, and, you know, being in a good church, that can help. Being in a good family, that can help. You know? Um, you can encourage each other in the family. You know, you can encourage each other to do what's right. Of course, the world, we understand, the world wants to break down the family. The world wants to say no, you know, and, and you talked a little about that in, in, on Sunday, I think it was, the whole, you know, to say that all families, oh yeah, single parent families, that's great, that's, you know, not a problem with that, you know. Not at all. But the family, that is, it's God's, you know, it's, it's God's institution. He, he was the one who ordained the family, you know. And the thing is, there's a real push in the world today um, where the idea is, oh, when you grow up, you just, you, you want to leave. You want to leave straight away. You go and go flatting. Big promotion to go flatting. Well, that's not the concept in the Bible. It says in Mark chapter 10, verse 7, it says, For this cause, this is Jesus speaking, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they two should become one flesh. Talking about when someone gets married. Now, when someone gets married, what does Jesus say happens? They leave their father and mother. What does that mean? Before they get married, the normal situation is they should be with their father and mother. Okay? Now, but the world says, no, that's always, you should go off and live by yourself. But the thing is, if you go off by yourself, what environment are you putting yourself in? What, are you going to go and choose to be in a, a flat that's a godly flat? And the fact is, it's, it's pretty hard to find a situation like that. Okay? I, I mean, I know in my own personal life, I mean, when I left home, you know, there was a whole pile of trouble that I got into. Because all of a sudden, I, there was no responsibility. There was no one keeping an eye on me. Okay, now, I mean, I was unsaved at the time, so that certainly didn't help, but it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's not a good situation to be in. The best situation to be in is stay where someone's responsible for you, keeping an eye on you, so someone knows when you're coming, when you're going, what you're doing. And then, when, you, when it's time to, you know, you want to leave and start your own family, get married. You know, that's kind of the normal thing. I mean, that, that's, why do you think it is? Why do you think it is? that traditionally a father would give away his daughter at a wedding. Isn't that what happens? You know, who gives this, you know, well, normally he marches her up the aisle, doesn't he? And he it's like he hands her over to the, to the husband. Why? Because prior to that, she was looked after by her father. Why? Because she'd lived at home. He was responsible for her. He looked after her. He provided for her. And now when he gives her away, she gets married. And that's someone else's responsibility to provide for her, to look after her. That's why it's done that way. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's God's design. But when a girl just goes off, I'm just going flatting by myself. When a boy goes off, I'm just going flatting by myself. That's not God's design. And it's asking for all sorts of trouble. Anyway, let's get back to um, 1 Samuel 10. Verse number, verse number 12. Verse number 12. And one of the same place answers. Remember they said, look, what did they say? They said, uh, what is this that has come into the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets. And one of the same place answered said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? So they were basically doubting that Saul could prophesy because he wasn't one previously and neither was his father. But then someone points out, well, what about the fathers of these other prophets? They weren't prophets either. And the thing about that is, that's interesting. You can change your family history. You can break the mould. You can achieve more than your ancestors did. You can look back and say, well, my mother was like this. My father was like this. You don't have to be like that. Now, maybe there's good aspects you can find from your father. There'll be good aspects you can find from your mother. And that's fine, but you don't have to repeat the bad aspects. You can change. You can be different from them. You can break that mould. Verse number 13. And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? 
And he said, to seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, he told us plainly that the asses were found. But of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. So Saul, after Saul finishes prophesying, he meets his uncle, he asks where they've been. Saul tells him what Samuel said about the animals are found. And, but he doesn't mention anything about the kingdom. You know, maybe he was concerned about what the reaction would be. You know, um, Mark 6, 4 Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among among his own kin and in his own house. Um, That could be the reason. It could just be the fact that he was, you know, at this stage, remember, he was little in his sight. He was humble. That might be why he didn't want to blow his own trumpet or anything. Verse number 17. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpeh and said unto the children of Israel, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So Samuel calls the people together, and he reminds them that the Lord brought them up out of Egypt. Now what did they have in Egypt? Pharaoh. What was Pharaoh? He was the king of Egypt, you know? Um, he, they, he reminds them, look, they del- that the Lord delivered them out of the hand of the various kingdoms in the land. What are kingdoms? They're places that are ruled over. So he's saying, you came out of here, there was a king, Pharaoh, these other places, they were kingdoms. God delivered you from all of that. You, did, you didn't have a king, and yet God delivered you from all these kings. And he actually tells them that by demanding a king, what they're really doing is they're rejecting God. They're rejecting God, because God is the one who should be their real king. He should be their only king. Look, if you were at um, John chapter number 19, we see an echo of this in John chapter number 19. When Jesus was going to be crucified, it says in John chapter number 19, verse number 14, John chapter 19 and verse number 14, it says, And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, this is Pilate, Behold your king. Verse number 15. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. That was their their very king was being put to death. But even apart from that, who was supposed to be their king? God was supposed to be their king. But they're saying, No, we've got no king but Caesar. Okay? And that's what we see back here in, in 1 Samuel 10. They were rejecting God from being their king. Verse number 20. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. And when he caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the tribe of Matri was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. So Samuel causes them all to come together. First of all, the tribe of Benjamin gets selected. After that, the tribe of Matri gets selected. Um, so the family of Matri gets selected. And then in, in that family, Saul gets selected. They look around. Where is he? There's no sign of him. Verse number 22. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. But the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. So they asked God. God lets them know, hey, Saul's hiding. And when they find him, he stands out among the people. Why? Because he's a head taller than anyone else. We We saw that earlier on. Verse number 24. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. So Samuel tells the people that this is the person that God has chosen to be their king. And of course, because we notice, the person who chose Saul, just as no, no mistaking, it wasn't the people. It wasn't Samuel. It was God. Have, have a look at Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Keep your finger on 1 Samuel 10. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 15. Deuteronomy 17 verse 15. Deuteronomy, uh, oh look at verse 14. When thou come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like all, like as all the nations that are round about me. So did God know it was going to happen? Absolutely he did. The people wanted to be like the nations about them, but that's not what we should be like. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world. But he says, look, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So it was God 
who had selected him. He chose him um, to be their king. And then the people, what do they shout? They shout, God save the king. God save the king. They're basically, they're saying, you know, God protect the king is what they're talking about because obviously they don't want the king to protect them and they say, God, look after the king. Um, verse number 25. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord and Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. So Samuel tells everyone and also writes it down how the kingdom is supposed to be run. Because it's not just a free for It's just not like, okay, Saul, you're in charge. Do whatever you want. No. There's supposed to be limits. There's supposed to be boundaries to the authority that men have. But of course, the problem is that power tends to have a corrupting influence. You know, it goes to people's heads. And they end up casting off all restraint. They have unbridled power. Um, and, I mean, we're going to see as we get, get through that, you know, that's what happens to Saul. You know, he goes crazy. Um, uh, what happens after the king gets appointed? The people then return to their own house. Verse number 26. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. So Saul also returns, a band of men who God's heart had, whose hearts God had touched go with him. The, the kingdom, it actually starts out well. People, they're, they're people who are well-intentioned, they've got good motives. And once again, it's just a reminder, if you want to achieve anything worthwhile, then try and sa- surround yourself with people who are going in the right direction. Find people who are going, think, what direction do I want to go in? Do I want to be going in a godly direction? Then let me surround myself with people that are going in a godly direction. Do I want to be someone who's, who's uplifting people and encouraging people? Then surround yourself with people who are also encouraging. You know? That's just, a, that's just a, a really helpful, because I mean, in the next chapter, you know, Saul, I mean, later on he ends up in, in bad straits, but in the next chapter, Saul, he wins a great victory over the Ammonites. It starts out well. And I think part of it is because he's there. He's with a band of men. God's touched their hearts. They're going in the right direction. Okay? But then verse number 27, it says, But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Now, so we see, we see that not everyone supported Saul as the king. And it's not because they were godly. It's like, no, we shouldn't have a king. We're supposed to be following what God says. That's not the reason here. But that was the opposite. These people, they were children of Belial. Children of Belial means children of the devil. That means they were wicked, evil, reprobate people. And they've always been around. They've always been around. Okay? Um, look, if you would, at Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter number 13. And verse number 24. Matthew chapter number 13. And verse number 24. <clears throat> Matthew 13 and verse number 24. He says, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. So you've got the, you've got the, you know, the man sowed, the, there's wheat in the field, but there's also tears. Tears is just an old, 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 old word for weeds. So you've got the, the crop growing up and you've got the weeds in among them, the tears. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tears? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tears, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tears, and bind them in bundles, to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So I say, look, should we gather up? Do we need to go out and root up the tears? Find out who are these wicked, evil, reprobate people. Should we have some sort of witch hunt? No, that's, that's not a good idea at all. And in fact, if we look back at 1 Samuel 10, what did Saul do? He held his peace. You know, he, he, he didn't worry about it. Because, you know, some, some of the people who are complaining could have been the whole children of Belive, but other people might just complain because some people complain. You know, and, and there can be a tendency, and especially within independent Baptist churches, to like, you know, a witch hunt. You know, who's the reprobate? Who's the reprobate? I mean, it's like, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, a crazy sort of attitude to have. But Jesus said, look, let them both grow up. Now, I'm not saying be stupid. I'm not saying, hey, look, trust everybody and, you know, send your kids and let them be looked after by people. No, you know, I mean, we just saw that, my wife was telling me the other day, there was something in the news, some, some guy... Some 21-year-old, he's doing some youth program or something, something to do with schools or something, and, and he's off grooming some 12-year-old girl. Nothing happened to him, though. No. You know, no jail time or anything. It's just a slap on the wrist. But anyway, what we've seen basically in this chapter, we've seen um, Saul gets, he, he's appointed king. 
Um, although it gets confirmed kind of later on in the when he has his first victory in the next chapter. And the thing about Saul is he wasn't someone who was great. He wasn't someone who was from a from a great family, from a great background. Remember Benjamin, least of the tribes. He's from a you know he, he was he wasn't a great person. Someone you know who's well known. It says in First Corinthians one twenty seven, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The weak things of the world, and that's who that's who Saul was at the start. Because of course, with God, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. We saw here Saul prophesying. It would be great if more people were preaching. That would be a fantastic thing. You know, some people might think, oh, I, I, I could never do that. I could never stand up and preach and teach the Bible. Well, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You know, Jesus said, apart from me you can do nothing, but guess what? You can do all things through Christ. And obviously, you need a spirit upon you. So get around the right people, you know? Get the sin out of your life. Have the Holy Spirit upon you. But also beware, because what we see as we go through, the thing that really costs all, and just turn if you would, because we'll finish off by singing um, part of Psalm 119. Turn to Psalm 119. The thing that costs all, he was little in his sight, he was humble, but later he became proud. And um, we often sing these verses, Psalm 119, verses 65, through 88. And it's interesting, when you look at some of these verses, look at verse number 69. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Look at verse number 78. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Look at verse number 85. The proud dig pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me. This is the right, this is the proud. Persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. Thou almost consume me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Notice, in all, all three stanzas we're talking about, the proud. Watch out for the proud. Watch out for the proud. What happened to Saul? He ends up becoming proud, and he ends up losing the kingdom. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, I just pray you'd help us to learn from your word. Help us to be around the right people. Help us to have the Holy Spirit upon us, Lord. We need the power of your Spirit, Lord. Lord, help us to get the sin of our lives. Help us to get, get anything that would, that would remove your power from us and get rid of it, Lord. Help us to get around good people who will lead us in the right way. And help us to beware of pride that, um, that Saul fell into. Thank you, Lord, for all those who've heard the gospel. Thank you for those who've called on the Lord, who've trusted you for salvation. Mm. And um, just continue to bless our, our, our labours and our efforts and uh, help us to shed your light abroad throughout this community. Mm. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Mm. Amen.